Um, so we have the first line data now, and I think that's firmly cemented. I think we can all agree it's firmly cemented, electing it as the, as the preferred first line drug for, for ALK positive stage four patients. Uh, but we have a lot of second line data that's emerged uh, with bregotinib and even seritinib and even electinib started out in the second line. Um, Luda, you want to go through uh, the data and highlight maybe the bregotinib data um, that we have so far? Sure. So um, we all agree that electinib currently is our de facto first line preferred agent. However, we still have patients who are currently receiving crizotinib. And remember, electinib is not yet approved in Canada as a first line, neither is approved in Europe. So it's only U.S. that has an access to an electinib first line. So you have a lot of patients who can still be doing well on crizotinib, and when they progress, you basically have three options. You have uh, seretinib, which has been tested in a post-crizotinib setting, response rate on approximately 60 to 70 percent, PFS um, around seven months. Then you have um, electinib, um, also two studies in crizotinib failure setting, response rate about 60 to 70%, PFS around nine months. And then you have brigotinib, and brigotinib I wanna spend a little bit more time on because the data is a little bit more recent, has been studied in a study that's called ALTA. So ALTA study took patients who were failing crizotinib, who were not exposed to other second generation ALK tyrosine kinase inhibitors, so they did not have seritinib or electinib. They were allowed to have prior chemotherapy, and patients were randomly assigned to two groups. Um, 90 milligrams continuous versus 90 milligrams for seven days, leading to increase to 180 milligrams. Those arms were not designed to be statistically compared. The reason why two arms were, uh, were done is so we can choose which of those those combinations we will move for the approval. There is actually rationale to use a higher dose of brigotinib because it has a higher CNS response rate, it has a higher CNS PFS, it has a higher systemic PFS, and that's why ALTA study was necessary to confirm that finding. And ALTA study did show that progression-free survival of brigotinib in crizotinib failure setting is 15.6 months. One of the highest PFSs One of the highest seen PFSs ever seen. Line, sorry, and this are. is also not the only study. So the phase one study was just updated last ASCO, and in phase one brigotinib study for the chrysotinib naive population, the PFS is 16 months. So if you put those studies, drug side by side, uh, brigotinib does have the longest reported PFS with all the caveats of cross-trial comparisons, yes. mm -hmm. but we have to do it because we don't have any other studies. Um, brigotinib, um, also in the preclinical data, there is actually a rationale why brigotinib might give you a higher PSF, PFS, because if you look at IC50s um, for inhibition of different ALK-resistant mutations, brigotinib seems to cut, um, cover all of them, and except seritinib and electinib, where there are certain pockets, certain resistant, resistant mutations where a seritinib or electinib could be um, resistant to. Um, drug is relatively well tolerated. Um, there is about 30% chance of mild nausea, 30% chance of mild diarrhea. 17% um, of the patients will get hypertension. There is a very rare side effect, which I think we need to talk about, is um, titled early onset pulmonary events. Um, the incidence of early onset pulmonary events is about 12%, all grades. The incidence of grade three early onset pulmonary events is about 3%, so it's rare. The, it's not a pneumonitis because the timing of the event is different, so it usually happens on about day number two. Patients might develop dyspnea, might develop uh, hypoxia. You stop the drug and everything usually goes away within three, four, five days, and then you can rechallenge and their symptoms might not recur upon rechallenge. But I think it's important if you're thinking about prescribing pre uh, brigadnib, just be aware that mm -hmm. you have to pay attention to shortness of breath for about two, three days after the first dose. And that was the rationale of doing a 90 milligrams followed by 180, because when brigadnib was studied in a phase one, the early onset pulmonary events were dose related. So that's a very nice summary of brigadnib um, and puts it in context of the other drugs. Where does this drug go? I mean, so, so ALTA-2 compared to the other second line uh, data looks very convincing. And we're going to have a front line study compared to crizotinib very soon reported out. Um, if we see similar results compared to crizotinib that we saw on the Alex, and we see, or even better, and we see second line results that are a little bit better than electinib, does this drug uh, potentially become enter the market in the first line after this front line ALTA data? 
I think it could. So we do have a little preview of what the first line efficacy of brigatinib um, is. Um, in the phase one study, there was eight patients who were enrolled who were crizatinib naive. Um, response rate was 100% and progression free survival 32 months. So it is possible that this drug after Alta 1L, which is expected to be released by maybe end of this year, beginning of next year, might add one more drug to our first line setting. But then the question is going to be, what are we going to do after your patient failed electinib or failed brigatinib first line? Sequencing strategies. Uh, always a challenge. It's, it's a, somewhat of an embarrassment of riches to have all these drugs. Uh, who would have thought we would have been struggling with what to sequence and how, given how little uh, targeted therapies we had five to ten years ago. Um, speaking of more drugs in the ALK space, we have lorlotinib, uh, a next generation ALK uh, inhibitor. Uh, we're going to have some, or we had some data uh, today at the poster session about lorlotinib, an update uh, that we've seen before. Um, Zosha, you want to walk us through the, the data with lorlotinib? I think it, you're right. It, this is really humbling to have so many different drugs, and now lorlatinib, which is a third generation ALK and ROS1 inhibitor, which really was designed not only to be a very potent ALK and ROS1 inhibitor in general, but also to have very good brain penetration. And, and, and the data that's been shown so far and has been updated at this ESCO has been very promising. They've looked at lorlatinib both in patients who were pretreated with prior crizotinib only, and then really strikingly in patients that were pretreated with one or two um, prior lines of second generation. ALK inhibitors, or even patients who had three or more prior ALK inhibitors. So it's really striking that we are in a situation where this is even a population to consider. And we saw really impressive results across the board, I think is really the bottom line with the lorlatinib. And in the lorlatinib study, they looked not only at systemic response rate, but also intracranial response rate. And we really see that lorlatinib is highly effective whether patients have been treated with previously with crizotinib only or any number of prior first or second generation ALK inhibitors. And in that prior, patients pre treated with prior second generation ALK inhibitors, we're seeing overall systemic response rates in the 40% range, intracranial response rates in the 40s as well, and duration of response in the, in the intracranial setting that can be, you know, can be 15 months or so. So mm -hmm. I think lorlatinib is really a very promising drug. We're mm -hmm. very excited to, to see more data with lorlatinib and, and really hoping to see it move into widespread use. So I'll ask the same question that I asked uh, Luda. Where does this drug fit in? Um, is it going to be in the refractory setting post-electinib? Is it? Do we do we move it in the front line? Uh, is it? I think is the it theme I, of targeted therapies yeah. in 2018 is when a drug works in the later lines of therapy, ultimately we want to see what it does in the frontline setting. Yeah. So I think it's certainly soon, hopefully, going to be here for our later lines of therapy, patients who have been treated previously with electinib, brigatinib, seretinib, all the other second generation drugs. But ultimately, I, I look forward to seeing the first line data yeah. because I think it could be really very promising as well. 